So, uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers uh, for allowing me to share in the science and culture of Brazil and, and uh, get a chance to meet some of you at least. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, I've been in the position of being one of the uh, last speakers at the last day of a long week, especially after uh, apparently a, a, a great event last night. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do, we're going to do a different kind of physics. We're just going to watch, right? So. The visual physics is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, uh, but you're not going to have to think hard. Uh, nothing like the NMR equations you had the other day. Um, it's just, if you can, I've joked many times before, if you can count to 10 in my lab, you're a biophysicist. So. <laughs> All right, so, um, now, uh, there are a lot of protein DNA systems, uh, protein DNA interactions, so uh, I, <laughs> I don't say this to the biologists in my, in my lab, no. So um, what I'd like to do is cover uh, a couple of interrelated topics. And again, the, the advantage of being the last person, uh, one of the last people at the meeting, is you have heard by some way, shape, or form um, something that bears upon everything I'll dis discuss. So, and I'll try to touch on those things. So that sort of many of the general principles have already, you've heard them. And I'll try to highlight them as they apply to protein DNA systems in particular. So the first topic I'll uh, address is how does the RECA protein uh, find DNA sequence homology? And this is a, a specific case of how, in general, do you search space uh, for a, a DNA sequence, particularly uh, space on a DNA molecule. Right? Uh, the second one is, uh, as I call it, some assembly required. Um, and, uh, this is that how do you assemble a, a, a filament of REC A protein? This is a, 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 a decided uh, uh, intentional event of REC A to self assemble in a filament. And the reason for that, again, I'll try to make clear as I go on. And then uh, some more assembly required. Uh, some of you have kids, not, not all of you. Uh, some of you won't admit to having kids uh, yet. Uh, so <laughs> now, the words that really strike terror in the hearts of, of people who have kids is that some assembly required. So I'll just tell you, if you get that box and it says some assembly required, uh, most par parental units just go into a terrible uh, uh, shock. So, uh, but nonetheless, most of the things in life, there's some assembly required. So, um, and the second part of the some assembly required is, is, it turns out that if you ask, how do you make a machine that does something, you never really come up with the answer that there's another machine that makes the machine, right? I mean, this is, this is life, and this is also engineering. So, and I'll tell you that there, this is the case for the assembly of this particular protein DNA system. Um, now, I'm gonna go through some, let's call it, uh, simple aspects of recombinational DNA repair, because even amongst biologists, it's sort of underappreciated what this process does, and the, the functions that I'll go through uh, won't really necessarily make sense to you unless you understand what it is that this system, this biological system, is supposed to achieve. So, uh, first of all, uh, DNA is damaged all the time. Uh, you don't have to be a, a student of biology to appreciate that. You hear this all the time. Uh, you're warned uh, not to go out on the beach. That's why you're all sitting in this room and not exposing yourself to sunlight. Um, so you're doing that. That part is good. Uh, but what most people think is that if I stay away from sunshine, cosmic rays, other kinds of ionizing radiation, uh, there's not much damage going on. And that's absolutely incorrect. Your DNA is being damaged constantly. I mean, just, just sitting in this room, there are numbers. I never can remember what they are. They're in reviews. Thousands of events per, per minute kind of things. But a simple one to remember is every time your cell divides, uh, you're going to get what's called a DNA break. And it comes a, 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 from a very simple consequence that when you replicate DNA, it's not a perfect template. Anywhere there's a nick, you can create a break. So there is a, a biological system. It's called recombinational DNA repair. And it's designed to repair those breaks. And uh, 
there, there are really two systems. One is called non-homologous end joining, which is error prone. I'll tell you why it's error prone in a second. The second one is homologous recombination. Now, non-homologous, imagine you, you get a chromosome that breaks. Uh, you, you're going to say, it's obvious what I have to do to fix it. I just take the two ends and I stick them back together. And that's what non-homologous end joining is. That's real simple if you know where the two ends are and you only have two ends. And you have eyes, so you could say, that's a blue hose and that's a red hose. I'm going to connect the blue end to the blue end and the red end to the red end. But blindfold yourself and I give you 100 breaks and you tell me which ones to connect. You have no way of knowing what to do. So non-homologous end joining works in, in a way that's error prone. Uh, those of you who are biologists will know it's cell cycle dependent. It's, it occurs when you don't have a sister copy. But homologous recombination, which I work on, um, is the smart and elegant way to repair DNA, of course, because uh, it uses a template. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, almost always in the cell, you have two copies of your DNA. And so uh, I, I won't go through the real blood and guts of this process. I'll try to highlight what, what goes on as principles. So when one of them suffers a break, the red one here, um, the ironic Thing, the, the step in the process is you actually degrade it more. And you, but you degrade a very special way. You degrade one of the two strands to reveal single strand DNA. Now why do you do that? Again, uh, what you're going to do, and let me step forward one step here, it's a template directed process. You're going to place that broken DNA across a template. So now imagine that you are have your eyes closed and you could re read Braille. So if you had two sequences that you were lining up and you could somehow sense that one is an exact copy of the other and where it is, and then you line them up, you have a template. And you can now copy off of the good version the information that's missing from the broken one. And that's what recombinational repair does. But to do that, again, you've always been told information, in terms of cellular information, is stored as duplex DNA. That's for reasons of stability. But when you read information, if you think of every biological process you know of when it comes to reading the information in DNA, that duplex DNA becomes single-stranded. Take replication as an example. So if we're up here, the reason you resect very specifically is to create single-strand DNA, which reveals the information in that broken molecule. But the blue molecule being intact will serve as a template provided that there's a way of matching the blue DNA to the red DNA. Turns out the protein that does the matching is the RecA protein, which I've mentioned here, shown here. Uh, that then serves as a template for re-replication, the light blue lines, of the missing information. Uh, we make these complex structures called holiday junctions. In fact, these are double holiday junctions. And through steps I won't go through, you can resolve them in, in such a way that you've fixed your DNA. You might have a patch in it, and they might even be crossed. But the bottom line is you fixed it at a site of sequence identity by using the identical copy you have in the cell. So it's a very clever way of doing things. And if you think about, you know, lots of times when you're trying to fix something you've never fixed before, the best way is to look at something that's not broken. I don't know about you, I've done this plenty of times. I, so you look at something and say, that spring is loose. Should it be loose? I don't know, let me take apart the one that I know works. And maybe the spring is supposed to be loose. Maybe it's not, not attached in the right place. Okay, so then, you know, if you're not a biologist, you, you run into this jargon. Uh, I can't help it, there are lots of proteins involved. They get names that are historical, but these are, a, as a group, these are proteins that represent helicases and nucleases that unwind and resect the DNA. These, as a group, are the proteins that are involved in this, let's call it, magical process called the homology search. They're the ones, Rec A is the principal protein. These proteins assist, and SSB, standing for single-strand binding protein, is an antagonist to the process. And this is, again, an important uh, biological detail. So you have a protagonist and an antagonist. And then you have the resolution. So uh, when I started work on this, I was interested in biochemistry. I was always interested in how the homology search worked. If you think about this, how do you get a protein to take two separate DNA molecules and find the sequence identity in them, not just in the test tube, but in any, this occurs in ev any living organism and can search in principle the entire space of, of all chromosomes, 
and find the unique homology. So over the, the decades, um, the biochemists and geneticists found homologs and analogs in the yeast, uh, serving as uh, 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 examples to, to then go further and look for uh, human proteins. And there are analogs and homologs in every organism and looked at, confirming the, the universality of this process. And um, what, again, um, you could be interested in this in the basic science level, uh, you can or certainly be interested in this from a health level because it turns out mutations in many of these proteins, I won't tell you which ones, uh, contribute, uh, lead to these uh, diseases. One common hallmark of these diseases is chromosomal instability. You see rearrangements of chromosomes and ultimately if you rearrange chromosomes too much, uh, this leads to uh, tumor genesis. If you're lucky, those cells are killed through apoptosis, but it turns out almost all of these diseases are in uh, accessory factors of the core process. So they simply attenuate it. They don't destroy recombinational repair. And so li uh, poor repair is worse than no repair at all. Okay, so that's the, the basic background. Uh, over the years, we've purified every protein on the slide and we started interrogating all these at the level of single molecules and those are the ones highlighted in the dark purple. So uh, we've, we've invested a fair bit of time into single molecule analysis and you can ask the question, why? I'll just, just to tell you, I'm going to focus only on RecA and some of its partners and I'll go, go back to it. So it turns out that the one reason um, we're interested in single molecule analysis is because uh, on so well, as powerful as ensemble experiments are, you're, you're always measuring an average. And uh, the, again, there are clever ways around some of these details, but in principle, uh, it can be as uninformative as reporting the sort of average weight, average height, you know, average IQ of the people in this room when you know very well uh, that every one of you differs substantially, and um, perhaps in very interesting ways. And um, so, uh, not perhaps, certainly in very interesting ways. So, um, uh, so the ensembles uh, are, are powerful uh, in the sense that you sample many, many molecules, uh, but you're, you're stuck with an average. And heterogeneity uh, is sort of another lecture I was thinking about and describing, but I won't have time. Intrinsic uh, static or dynamic heterogeneity is something that has become very uh, uh, clear to be the case for single molecule behavior. So uh, just to remind you, um, this is what a RecA filament uh, sort of looks like as a cartoon. And again, somebody made the comment earlier in the meeting that uh, cartoons of molecules uh, are always misleading because they give you the impression of some static structure. Uh, but I've always joked before, for many years, I said now that we've all always been single molecule biochemists or biophysicists because all our cartoons look like this. I mean, so <laughs> deep inside, we've always wanted to see one. Right? and know what one does, because, because we draw the pictures that way, of course. So the filament will assemble. It's a helical filament, as implied here, and I'll show you some images. And that is the active entity. So now remember, there's sequence information in that DNA. So those of you who've thought about uh, searches by uh, proteins like repressor proteins that find a specific target on DNA, the... the, the um, um, Intelligence of that protein is defined by the polypeptide which you, uh, structure which is capable of finding a unique sequence. That protein binds a unique sequence. RecA itself does not bind any specific sequence. Instead, it uses the information in that single-strand DNA to define its sequence specificity. It, if you want, is a chaperone that somehow aids the, uh, the search and uh, recognition and finally, DNA strand exchange uh, of, of the process. And I just want you to go back to one cartoon here. So I want to highlight that once you've assembled the filament on here where it's not shown on this, this resected tail, the next step is, is finding homology, recognizing it, and then promoting the invasion of that strand into the duplex, displacing the resident strand that's identical. This structure is called a joint molecule or a D loop. So all of this. This step three is, ach is achieved by Rec A alone. <clears throat> okay, so that it's going to find a target sequence in duplex DNA. So um, in, in about 2001, we started our single molecule analysis uh, of, of helicases in particular. And uh, we've sort of adapted a lot of methods that have come on 
uh, inspired initially, this is the sort of first approach we use. We take an obstacle trap, we uh, trap a bead onto which we attach a DNA molecule, typically through a streptavidin biotin linkage. We'll put streptavidin on the bead, uh, biotin <laughs> on the end of the DNA. And then if we label a DNA with an uh, intercalating fluorescent dye, we can image it. Uh, this was, again, inspired by Steve Chu. He was one of the first to show that you can actually image single molecules of DNA, and he des described their elastic properties when he, when he used, uh, turned flow on and off. So here we've extended it. Uh, again, now this is for all you who, who haven't been paying attention to your physical chemistry. This is extended by flow, and you have to know that because DNA is a worm-like or a random coil. Uh, it has a persistence length of only about 50 nanometers. You can calculate its mean square end to end distance if you remember your statistical uh, uh, thermodynamics of, of polymers. Uh, it would only be about a micron in diameter if this was not being extended by flow. Uh, so we use the flow obviously to see where uh, things bind. Uh, we can use a dual optical trap where we simply do exactly what I just described but attach the DNA at both ends of, uh, uh, with uh, streptavidin biotin links and use a dual trap to extend the DNA. That has the advantage that we don't need flow. We can have conditions of flow on, flow off, and again, we use fluorophores to, to image this. And this imaging is done using epifluorescence and uh, an alternative is to use uh, TERF, Total Internal Reflection Microscopy, which is a surface method where the laser comes in at uh, uh, the critical angle and illuminates only a, a few hundred uh, uh, angstroms of, of uh, distance above the, the, the surface. And it has a high sensitivity, which if you attach your, your DNA with both ends on the surface, you can image it with, uh, a, very, with a high background uh, with very, low signal to, very good signal to noise. And you can also attach it at one end and use flow to extend it. So th this is sort of the toolbox that we use. And I should say, I'm not showing you at all uh, the sort of dozens of other uh, single molecule methods that, that have been developed by others. Um, we, we have a sort of personal bias as to what we want to do. Uh, I really want to image the protein DNA complexes. So we've always uh, wanted to see what, what is there. Uh, the adage is seeing is believing, unless you go to a magic show, uh, then, then all bets are off, of course. But, um, there are methods which use force uh, measurements, right? So if you take a look at this uh, configuration, for example, of two optical traps, um, you could imagine that you can uh, detect binding to the DNA. Now imagine, you can see how you can detect binding to the DNA if the force extension behavior of the DNA, the elasticity of the DNA, is somehow changed. So you, but you wouldn't know, for example, where the protein is bound. You would know it is bound, but you wouldn't know where unless you could directly image it. Again, clever people come up with clever alternative solutions. Um, like I said, uh, we, we've taken the strategy of being very direct and wanting to image everything. So everything we, we, we do is using fluorescently tagged proteins. Which, um, and so how do we then do this experimentally? Um, this, this is an instrument I'm proud of because we, we built it for uh, zero dollars. I mean, it didn't cost our federal government or institution a penny, uh, and it was all put together with cobbled components, largely from Ron Baskin, Yin Ye, uh, and, and, and uh, Larry Brewer. And there's an old microscope here with even a cheap CCD camera that was good enough to visualize yo-yo one fluorescence on DNA. It's quite bright. Uh, those of you who um, have keen eyes will recognize the fine quality optical bench here. It's about 1945 vintage. Uh, there's a, there are some brass fittings in, oh, there's the brass turn handle up on that one, uh, made in London. Um, it, it all worked just well enough for us to get our first 20 molecules, and, and as they say, the rest was history. Uh, there's a laser out here. You can see it's, it's just focused um, uh, uh, over here onto the microscope. And so this is the, the configuration. And then we have a, a flow cell mounted there where we use syringe pumps because one very important component of all of our uh, strategies is to use these uh, micro-machine laminar flow cells where we can um, uh, actually dip the protein, dip the DNA into, into any solution we wish. So again, if you want to think about this, uh, what, what would be ideal from a, uh, let's say, a biochemist, biochemist or biophysicist point of view, if you could literally grab your, your, your DNA or grab your protein, if you had the way of just grabbing one and dipping it into any condition you want, 
you know, maybe like, like coloring Easter eggs, if you wish, but you, any, anything, making, making candles, you know, dipping them in and out. So we, and we can now do this uh, with up to six channel configurations and phase reactions in a way we want by uh, using this kind of strategy with the laminar cells. All right, so it turned out this, this microscope really wasn't very good uh, in terms of sensitivity. Uh, so with the help of uh, the NIH and uh, talented people like Achiro, uh, we've built a, a better one, and this is even an old photograph, but it's a dual optical trap. Uh, which with force feedback control, so we can measure both, we can both directly image and we can measure force extension curves of DNA, for example. It has the capability of excitation with up to three different uh, excitation wavelengths and imaging with three, uh, the fluorescence of three different emission wavelengths, uh, and we can get that up to four now uh, pretty easily. All right, so, so that's, the, that's the kind of instrumentation. Um, and so now let me get to the science. Um, so how does rec -A protein find homology? Well, first, I have to define some terms. Uh, there are at least two kinetic steps in the process. The first one is the search itself. So this is the process by which the DNA sequence is found in space. So that's simply that, as how do you find, through a combination of uh, uh, three, and I'll tell you, one-dimensional searches, do you, do you find uh, uh, the sequence? The, the second step is homologous recognition. So imagine that you found a piece of DNA. How do you know it's the right sequence? Right? So that's a second problem. First, you have to find DNA. Then you have to identify the sequence. So again, uh, the analogy I give to, to, to people in my class is that uh, I'm going to blindfold you, right? shut the lights off in the room, I'm gonna, and I'm going to put a treasure chest in the middle of the room, and you have to find it. Right? And that's a 2D problem, and you can see that's easier than a 3D problem, but that's, that's basically what proteins face as a problem. Uh, and you'll have different strategies. Some of you will be very compulsive. You'll like walk up and down the room in, in a nice row. Uh, that's the wrong strategy, actually. Uh, some of you will be totally random. Uh, you'll be a great example of 2D diffusion. That's actually probably that's the way it's going to work. Uh, molecules can't march up and down in rows unless you throw in some energy. Uh, and, uh, but I can also make life a little easier for you and say, I'm going to attach a rope to it. And so this is more the analogy to DNA. So the treasure chest is on the rope, but you don't know where. So you're smart. <coughs> Evolution has made you smart. What are you going to do? You're going to randomly go around the room, first, of course, looking for the rope. I mean, you're not going to go looking for the treasure chest. If you're lucky, you'll find it. But if you're thinking, you're going to say, I'm going to look for the rope. Then you find the rope. Again, if you're smart, you're not going to let go, right? Because you know the treasure chest at the end of the rope. But, uh, you know, we have to make things realistic. You can't translocate unidirectionally. Well, we can make, say translocate unidirectionally if you want, uh, but you still don't know where the treasure chest is, so you still have to have an effective search strategy over the distance length of the rope. I mean, when do you decide to quit and run the other way? Uh, and this has all been figured out uh, in years past. So um, these are issues that, that come up all the time in protein-DNA interactions. And I think one of the seminal papers published was uh, by my former postdoc, Peter von Hippel, uh, which, which this summarizes it very uh, simply, is that any protein looking for a sequence on DNA has multiple kinetic pathways for, uh, with regards to a search strategy. The one that every uh, molecule can undergo is an uncorrelated macroscopic uh, dissociation. You bind DNA, you dissociate, and you're out in bulk. Uh, a second one is a called, they called it hopping. It's an intradomainal dissociation, reassociation. It happens because DNA is a rigid rod on short distances. So the prob if you dissociate here, there's a certain probability that because it's a rigid rod and not a point source, that you will come back down in the vicinity of that DNA. And that appears uh, as a sort of a hopping event. Again, these are all energy, not, not driven by any translocation process, uh, any en energy input. The other one is sliding. And when this was put together, uh, sliding had been proposed to explain how LAC repressor found a sequence. In fact, the per first person to propose this was, was Manfred Eigen, Richter and Eigen. Uh, it was not widely received by the community. It was sort of viewed as a, a nice hypothetical possibility, uh, yet uh, several decades of biochemical work uh, put it on, I'd say, very firm footing, and now uh, work, Sunny G, for example, have directly imaged sliding on DNA molecules. So this is well established. 
sort of a poor uh, 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 cousin to all of those that is shown here, intersegmental transfer. And I'm going to uh, highlight it was a poor cousin because it requires uh, at least a, a divalent uh, binding site. And uh, it was proposed for lac repressor because that protein is a tetramer. Two monomers uh, bind uh, the sequence, and the other two are free. So in principle, you can have an intermediate state where you transfer by having segments of DNA come close to one another. So I'll get back to this in a while. It's clear, it's absolutely clear that the legs one, pathways one, two, and four in this cartoon have been very well documented and established as being useful in finding sequence homologies on DNA. All right, so how does RECA find sequence homology? And I teach this, I've been teaching this for years, and I can tell you what, how it does not. It's very easy to say how it does not. So it does not find it by any ATP hydrolysis dependent translocation or any ATP dependent process. And I didn't tell you there's a lot of background I'm going to just sort of throw at you as, as needed. Uh, but REC A is an ATPase. It's a DNA dependent ATPase. It will hydrolyze ATP. Uh, and so one of the first ideas was it translocates with this chain of D single strand DNA somewhere around the, the, the duplex DNA finding homology. Uh, but we've shown that not only uh, do you not need ATP hydrolysis using analogs, you don't even need ATP. You can use a non hydrolyzable analog uh, that's ADP aluminum fluoride. And this comes up, uh, I think it was uh, 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 Jose who mentioned uh, for uh, uh, the motor proteins um, kinesin, the stepping is not driven by ATP hydrolysis is the same concept here. All the work that rec -A does is by binding ATP, and ATP is simply a switch. It turns the protein into an active state, and now you ask, how do you shut something off that you've turned on? Well, you can't just go to the wall and shut the switch off. One way biology does this is to destroy the effector molecule. If ATP is the molecule that turned it on, you have the protein to which it's bound, hydrolyze it. And now you shut it off. And that's basically it. So what, depending on how, how I say this, I can say ATP hydrolysis has no role whatsoever in the homology search. But I would never say that ATP hydrolysis has no role in biological function of this protein. Because it's easy to design a protein that binds tightly to DNA. It's not so easy to design a protein, it's, in fact, it's very difficult to design something that binds tightly to DNA and at the same time dissociates. It's, 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 it's a non sequitur. If it binds tightly, it has a very slow dissociation rate constant. Right? So, but by switching states, you can do this at will. And that's what biology does. It's one trick. Okay, so what about the second possibly sliding? Uh, a very good colleague of mine, Kenji Azuma, published a very nice paper uh, that had all wonderful negative results that there's no sliding, all right? So we kind of said, okay, um, uh, nonetheless, I couldn't tell you what the mechanism is. So in fact, sometimes I, I just, you know, I'll say so out of that. Uh, no sliding at all? It's, it's no sliding over the distance of one kilobase. So, so uh, the, the interest at this and the capabilities at this point were only long, long distances, yeah. So, and actually, actually very good point, because I'm going to give you an answer that sliding is still not involved, but at the level that we've defined, we can't exclude. In fact, I wouldn't exclude something over short distances of, say, tens or, or so base pairs. All right, so um, now, you know, I mean, so the answer is obvious. It has to be physical chemistry. <laughs> I mean, it has to be, right? There, there are only so many possibilities. And so we hope to be able to image this. And I can tell you, Tony, uh, Tony Forget, who was a postdoc in my lab, uh, worked on this problem. And uh, what, I'm gonna, what that picture up there uh, shows an optical trap, dual optical trap, with a lambda DNA molecule uh, tethered between two beads. And that red spot is a rec A nucleoprotein filament that has found its target. Okay, so that's the answer. And we'll tell you how that happened. Now, again, it, it also took uh, Tony a about five years to get this, uh, this answer. So um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some of his misery because uh, it's an interesting scientific story, I think. It's, again, like Jose's random walk uh, thing for, for, for both postdocs and students. Um, so, um, okay. Oh, and I should say, you know, people in my lab range from geneticists to, to, to 
physics and astronomy people. And um, if something's not clear, please stop me, okay? And the reason why I say this is because, you know, certainly I have people, genetics people in my lab, they wouldn't know what a partition function is. They probably even had never heard the word, right, when they show up in the lab. At the same time, I had somebody from physics and astronomy in the lab, a great guy, smart guy, uh, could, could, you know, run circles around anybody with math mathematics and, and uh, high sensitivity image detection methods. Uh, but for years, he thought lambda DNA, not years, for months, I should say, for, he thought lambda DNA was, I think, like a physicist might think, it's the lambda ith molecule, right? So there's like an alpha DNA, there's a beta DNA, a gamma. So he just sort of thought lambda DNA was the lambda ith DNA, right? Now, for those of you who, who aren't laughing, that means you don't know either, maybe. Uh, so it turns out it's a living organism. It's called lambda bacteriophage. It's a phage that, it's a, bac it's a virus that infects bacteria. Its name is lambda. It probably was the lambda-ish ith virus that somebody discovered on a petri plate, but it has, uh, in this co connection, it's, it's just the name of an organism from which we get the DNA. It's very well defined, 48,583 base pairs. So, uh, so when I say lambda DNA, that's what I'm referring to. It's about 16 microns in length is the contour length. All right, so what Tony started, so now, I have to say, we weren't sure what we were going to see, but we hoped we could see uh, the process itself, whether it was sliding or some searching. So um, the, the strategy he took was to take uh, just a, a very simple uh, single-channel flow cell, shown here, and he's going to attach both ends of a DNA molecule to the surface by, using, by putting streptavidin on the surface, flowing in DNA, and when DNA flows in, one end randomly attaches, the flow causes the other end to extend, and if there's a biotin sparsely uh, with the right density on the surface, you can extend it to almost contour length. And shown up here is a DNA molecule that is extended to almost contour length, stained with yo-yo uh, one, a, 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 a nice fluorescent dye. And that spot there is gonna be a useful uh, a control it's a broken molecule, which only could attach at one end because the, the other end was missing. And we're going to turn flow on to convince you that this one is tethered at both ends. And so when you turn flow on, um, it's going to go on. See the, the DNA molecule extend, and then it will collapse back. So it's about half length. And you can see how small the end-to-end uh, -end distance or, or radiation gyration of that molecule is uh, compared to contour length. All right? And this is, even though it's half length, so it, it, you know, it'd be about a half micron or so, in very round numbers. So, uh, and we're, this is all, everything I'll show you is optical limited, so we're, we're at about a 200 nanometer uh, uh, resolution. So, you know, this, and it's gonna be fine for everything we described. All right, so just memorize this. I mean, this is one of those movies you have to memorize. That's contour length, that's collapsed DNA, uh, or random coil DNA. Uh, so then, Oops, I'm not sure what happened here, but uh, oof, okay, uh, we had some problems. So uh, let me tell you what this slide was supposed to show you, is that uh, using some um, techniques, Tony was able to make some substrates that uh, he made fluorescent by making the DNA fluorescent, so we can use native protein. And the targets on the lambda DNA molecule are shown by these red spots, and we use three different targets, and so if Reke found homology, and we used the, oh boy, this really did get screwed up, sorry. Um, the 400, I can't even read it. Um, this, there's a 400 piece, a 1400 piece, and a 7, 1700 base pair piece. So these are, yeah, my apologies for that slide. So let me just tell you that they would appear at, at certain places on the DNA that were diagnostic of having found that sequence homology. And so the very first experiment he did was he, uh, and we verified that everything was okay in the ensemble, and the very first experiment is to actually do the homology search and pairing in a test tube in the ensemble, and then ask, do, does, does everything, can we see it in, in, at the level of a single molecule? And so you take the contents of that tube, put it into the flow cell, spread it out, and what do you see? You see a red spot on the green DNA, and that shows you exactly that it bound at the homologous target. And so we knew it was working. And we can, I can show you movies that show that yeah, basically this is a different molecule. Uh, we can tell when something is at a target site at this particular target 
by basically uh, playing around with light, but uh, the illumination. But basically, when a DNA molecule breaks, you know that one's not on the background because it disappears. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm too fat fingered here to use this. Uh. Okay. So. Uh, this spot, which is in a, the homologous site, when a DNA molecule breaks, it will disappear from there. But some of the ones that are background and bound to the surface uh, do not. Right? So we, can, we do this for every molecule. After we get the answer, we let uh, photo bleaching or photo uh, uh, break cleavage uh, break the molecule, and we can verify that's a positive result or not, and, as opposed to being background. Yeah, so this is uh, false coloring, but what, uh, that last slide that was totally uh, uh, destroyed was we take the DNA, we, we make single-strand DNA by PCR, and we incorporate a, a amino allyl derivative of the UTP, and then we post... So this is a short double-stranded? Uh, short single-stranded, yeah, short single-stranded. And the target is double-stranded. So Rec A needs to bind single-strand DNA, and then uh, it, it will find a target in double-strand DNA. And all the coloring here is, is false. So, um, okay. Um, so then the experiment, right? So after this, this, I think, is about year three of his project. Um, and so now he's got the DNA on the surface, stretched out. He flows in the nuclear uh, protein filaments, the red, the red dots. And if all goes well, um, we should be able to watch one appear at some site on that DNA. And so sure enough, he turns on the microscope and starts watching. And you see spots going by. All those little red spots are filaments going by. The flow is actually off in this experiment. They're just diffusing around. And you keep watching and watching and watching and watching. And I will tell you, he kept watching. He did this for hundreds of molecules. Seems like hundreds of days. And the one spot that we thought might have been on the DNA, it was when the DNA broke. You saw, hopefully, it was on the background. So it was a false positive. So um, he just kept doing this and going back to the control, which was this experiment, and it would always work. So at this point, we're a little stymied. This is supposed to work. So we're lucky, like everything else in life, if you're observant and, and science gives you a break, uh, there are some molecules, I told you, are broken and don't attach at both ends. So when he went off to go get some coffee or cry in misery or something at one point, he shut the flow off, shut the uh, intensity of lasers off, also shut everything down, um, um, and then came back and turned it all, all back on again. And what he observed is when he extended out, there was a red spot, and I'll show you in the, in the, the video. And so it was there. Well, so this, we had, the, we had the nature paper written already. We knew the answer. We knew that if you watch molecules, they won't react. That was a... <laughs> so, in fact, for the biologists in the crowd, meiosis underpinned, uh, recombination underpins meiosis, which is part of uh, gametogenesis, which is part of sex. So, you know, it's very perfect, you know. I mean, if you watch, they just won't perform. That's the way, that's the way it goes. Um, so, now... The scientists in the, in the crowd will say, wait a minute, that, you know, there's one other possibility. You have a free end there. Somehow it got on that free end, and that was key. The other thing we were already starting to wonder, it, had to, it might have something to do with the DNA conformation, because here it's coiled, and here, well, here it's extended. So fortunately, again, we had some examples of molecules. Oh, this is just to show you an epifluorescent mode. It's the same thing. When, uh, I'll skip that. Um, so in this case, uh, the, mo the molecules are attached almost laterally to one another. So when they extend, um, they will make a U-shape. And what he found was for these molecules, when the flow was turned off and then turned back on, he got pairing. So that eliminates the need for an end, because these are tethered at both ends. But it did not eliminate the, uh, the, the coiling, uh, the, the need for coiling. And I think we all would agree it would be hard to get past the famous referee number three with a... With a paper that says molecules don't react if you don't if you're watching them it would be a great title though wouldn't it uh, so uh, okay so that's where we were so now what do we do there's only one way to reliably control the uh, coiling of DNA flow would 
as you show, saw in the movie, flow does change the, from elongated to coil, coil structure. But if you look at the dynamics of, of DNA extension by flow, the DNA is most extended at the bead, least extended at the end, because the force exerted at the DNA, it's all drag force by flow, is greatest at the bead, so it's a nonlinear distribution of, 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 uh, of extension. And so to do this reliably, we decided to completely dump that whole strategy and um, use uh, this, this dual uh, bead dumbbell configuration. Oh, and then we did molecular dynamic simulations. There, there you go. Uh, so that's, that's what we expected to do, is just move them back and forth and change the end-to-end the, 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 the -end distance and hence the coiled nature of the DNA. OK, so um, how do you make uh, a dumbbell? Well. Dan knows very well, in, in California, you just uh, adopt uh, the education policies of a Republican. Uh, oh, I, 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 I should have said not, not, not uh, any dumbbell, uh, uh, restricted to DNA dumbbells. So, um, well, the last governor, yeah, yeah. yep, absolutely. So, uh, but how do you make a DNA dumbbell? So it turned out this, this was kind of fun, but it took Tony about six months to get this developed to a science. And so we now have a dual optical trap two positions. We trap one bead uh, with DNA on it. You can see instantly when it gets trapped, you'll see the DNA extended. And then we, we have the one uh, controlled by a steering mirror, and we can stick it on and look at that. And then this was Olympic season, so we could do the uh, Olympic iron cross with the DNA, uh, stretch them around. Uh, you can tell which optical trap is stronger. than, And that was the difference between extended and coiled. You might have seen it for, for a brief second there. So, uh, so all of this was, again, lots of fun. Um, I think Tony didn't want to stop, but Tony didn't make me feel like, you know, he was really working hard. He said this isn't very easy because every once in a while he, he gets uh, uh, molecules that just don't really want to uh, 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 get together, so to speak. So uh, this, there's a lesson here for all of you who go out, to, uh, out, uh, out tonight somewhere. So you can, you know, you, you just don't always get the right, can't, partners don't always pair up. And so here's one he's trying to, he's trying to, He's being a little rough there. It's like like bumping, and he said, "Come on, come on." It's just uh, it's not really a good technique to sort of like just poke at somebody, right? So, uh, but but then again, look at that. After a little bit of effort and coaxing, uh, he could then finally make a nice dumbbell. And uh, you know, look at that, and and isn't it nice? Uh, if uh, if this my computer weren't so slow, it would get to the end, which is coming up in just a second. There we go, right? So so. <laughs> All right, so again, uh, this, this has nothing to do with science, uh, but, but again, you're here, this is the last day of the conference, uh, the school, so uh, you're, you're here to enjoy yourselves as much as learn, hopefully. Now, uh, again, all of that was still not sufficient. And why is that? Because to make these dumbbells, what I didn't show you, but I'll show you in a moment, is we need to use the laminar flow channels to keep flow going so that we can, because remember, once you trap something, uh, you have to get out into a clean channel where you don't pick either other beads in the trap or other DNA molecules on the bead or collect more than one uh, bead by some nonspecific means. So we need the flow channels to build things. But uh, the hypothesis is that the coiled structure of DNA is essential. So we needed a, a reservoir on our flow cell that we could move the DNA dumbbell into, wh which was devoid of flow. So. Uh, this is a prototype. This is a three-channel flow cell that Tony made. And, and you can see here that there are three inlet channels. And this gives you some idea how it looks with some dyes. And if we blow it up, uh, you can see a little bit how it looks. The, these are the laminar flow sections, one, channels one, two, and three. But perpendicular to those channels is this reservoir where we're going to put the RecA nucleoprotein filaments. And then we're going to pull the beads into this channel the, with the DNA and do the reactions in a flow-free environment. So oh, that's, here we go, dual bead, he pulls it over again. And we do this by translocating the microscope stage. Of course, the optics are all fixed, so all this is being done by translating the microscope stage. And then we move into this channel, this would be our observation port, move it all the way in here, do the reaction, and then we pull it back out to ask what happened when it was in that channel where they were reacting. So the real flow cell had four channels, and, and the reason for that will become obvious in a moment, because the strategy was that we would first trap a bead, and then you have to pull this bead uh, out of the first channel so other beads don't accumulate on it. Then you go into a channel that has DNA. You pick up one DNA molecule, 
and when you pick up one, you quickly move it to the third channel before you pick up more than one DNA on that bead. And then you use the steering optics to move the, the bead to the other end, the second bead to the other end. You attach the, 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 the second bead to make the dumbbell. And then you move that, uh, uh, use the steering optics again to move the bead back to a lateral position to change the end-to-end -end distance. And this is still under flow, so it'll look like a U. But then when we move it into the reservoir that's flow-free, you'll have DNA at its normal uh, configuration as defined by that end-to-end -end distance. And then that's pulled back out to the observation channel to see what happened. Okay. So, and sure enough, it works. Now, again, uh, if you haven't done these experiments, they're, they're great fun, and I do make some fun of the experiments, but they are extremely technically challenging. Um, and so uh, Tony and many other people in the lab have become great practitioners, and like many things in science, it now has become that, that we can train just about anybody to do this um, who's got good hands. So, so here's the movie. Here's, here's how, the, how it works, and, and shown here on the right is, uh, is, is just uh, steps in the flow cell where we are. So you capture two beads. You'll see his dumbbell style is a little more elegant. He's learned to be nicer. Uh, so you catch one DNA molecule on one bead. And this is yo-yo one staining, so that's why the color is there. But now notice the, the very slick method, the sort of pulling the DNA across the back of that, that particular bead's neck. And then, then, it, then they hook on. And then um, um, he's going to move it, uh, picks the end. Removes the, we, uh, I should say, we remove the dye by going to the D-stain channel. The dye stays on the beads, uh, but it's off the DNA. Then he's going to move it over to, um, to the reservoir. And you can see, again, it turned red because uh, of the false color indicating uh, rec -A filaments. He pulls it back out, and already you can see something right there. And he's going to extend it to find out where it is. And when he extends it, we now are at almost contour length. And it turns out that red spot is at a homologous target. So um, that's the entire strategy. And so basically, uh, the question is, were we right? So the, now we're at like year five, I think. And the short answer is, uh, well, first of all, this shows you the pair. We're expected. Those are the substrates, 430, 1762. I'll skip that. But this, this basically is the experiment that uh, I would say says it all, which is if we look at the number of molecules that are homologously paired as a function of the center-to-center -center bead distance, and this cartoon illustrates the sort of uh, artist rendition of what's going on. The, f the frequency of pairing decreases monotonically as you, and again, mon I'll say monotonically, we haven't modeled the shape, but as you move the distance out. So much so that, in fact, if you extrapolate this curve to zero, it's somewhere around nine, maybe 10 microns in separation. And if you remember, I said that in the turf methods where we s were extending them on the surface, the average distance was about 13 microns uh, in separation. So we were doing a turf experiments out here, which says, of course, we should not have seen any pairing because there's almost no coiled configuration to the DNA. Uh, and this, this uh, we could maybe have, if we waited infinitely, probably would have seen something. Now, it turns out these, uh, you can do some uh, more quantification. And again, we have error bars and averages. So the, the uh, unfortunate frustration of single molecule analysis is you can't just do one, and so then, then you have to show everything as mean numbers nonetheless. But we can show that the rates <laughs> of pairing are affected by, sep by the bead separation, not the yields. So as you move them further apart, it's very simple. The rate at which you find homology decreases. And then what, what happens if you make the single-stranded DNA filament longer? So that is the searching component if it's longer. And the answer is that um, the rate uh, increases with longer DNA and decreases to almost, uh, unde well, I'll say undetectable amounts for a short fragment of 162 nucleotides. So that means the element that is searching needs a certain, uh, I'll tell you again now the answer, a certain uh, number of binding sites, polyvalency, to make an effective search in the three-dimensional space of the DNA configuration. And so, um, now, again, uh, let me just go back here and give the introduction for the next movie. Uh, biochemists, biophysicists live by intermediates. You can understand the pathway of a process if you could identify intermediates that are on pathway. So we noticed that when Tony was, he, Tony noticed when he was pulling them out of the reaction chamber, 
that not only were there spots uh, at the expected location, but every once in a while he'd see nuclear protein filaments at locations that were clearly non-homologous, i.e. heterologous. Those were always short-lived, but some of the longer-lived ones, they're only a few seconds, I'll show you in the next few movies. And so when we go... Just one yeah. So, so it really does, with the longer segments, it really does sort of achieve the 100%. 100%, yes. Every one of them. Right. right, right. We were concerned that there was some artifact that didn't get us to 100% yield. They're, they're clearly everyday chemical reactions, bimolecular reactions that go to the same endpoint. Yeah. So here's um, two beads. He's pulling out of the uh, uh, reaction chamber. And now watch what's going to happen as he separates those beads. Because he's doing two things. He's dragging them out of the reaction. So you'll see the, the DNA kind of leaning off to the right, you'll see some spots, and as they separate, you'll see two spots, but you'll see one go away before the other one. And uh, uh, oh, it's on the other side. He, he, yeah. So there you see one. You can't tell, but right now you can see there's two very clearly. And watch the one on the left; it just disappeared. So it's always unstable. So it means heterologous interactions are are not stable or stable on at most to about a second or two. But um, if we um, uh, I, I, I'll show you the data in a second. But most of them don't even survive this. Now, this is exactly what you want in a homology search because you don't want to be binding tightly to off-target locations. Otherwise, the search would take forever. Right? And then the other kind of events we could see are looping events. So the same experiment. Um, to make it a little clearer, we've drawn this out in a chymograph. And the key thing to, to watch is in this, at this time in, in, in the movie, but at this point in the graph, you see there's two spots. So again, the green are the positions of the beads at the DNA ends. The two red lines are two RECA nuclear protein filaments. The one that's bound homologously clearly is this one because it persists. The one that's non homologously bound is this one. It, it dissociates right here. But when it dissociates, you see there's a translocation of that red line, and that's explained by a loop. So when there's a loop, it just pops. And you'll see this again in the movie. And that's the, the line was drawn through there. So watch again as it goes along, pulls it apart, and when the red one on the left disappears, the one in the middle popped. So we get both non-specifically bound species, and some of those make loops. And when you look at the distribution of those, um, the, here are the numbers, but the important thing is the relative amount. We get more non-specifically bound species when you have the longer nuclear protein filaments, and we get clearly many more loops when we have, again, the longer nuclear protein filaments. So non homologously bound species and loops are intermediates on the pathway to the search, is what we propose. And so to summarize this part, uh, we can see uh, homologous pairing. And it's sensitive to the end-to-end -end distance of the double-strand DNA target. When you increase the end-to-end -end distance, you decrease the rate of pairing, but not the yield, demonstrating that the randomly coiled state of double-strand DNA is important. The length of the single-strand DNA filament affects the rate of DNA pairing, again, not the yield. Uh, and when you increase the DNA length, you increase the rate of pairing. And this suggests that multiple non-homologous contacts between the filament and DNA enhance the homology search. Finally, we can detect multiple weak non-homologous contacts. And so we're going to propose that the RECA uh, finds homology through a 3D search procedure that we're going to call intersegmental contact sampling. And so the cartoon, oh, this is for the kineticists in the crowd. Basically, there's a very rapid step, uh, which is diffusion limited, but it involves non-homologous, the non-homologous binding. These uh, are weak interactions, so they're reversible, but somewhere in this species is the one that's competent for a second slower step to find, uh, to find the homologous target. And this, this rate in particular is the one that's enhanced by the three-dimensional structure of DNA. And so here's the cartoon, as best as we can draw a cartoon. Uh, again, you have to think about this in a much more dynamic way. And we're only showing two contacts right here between the filament. But if you start off at the top, the red is the nuclear protein filament. Uh, uh, statistically, it has to bind non-specifically. So the contacts are by, by uh, their very nature starting off as non-specific. But if you have two or more, and I'm going to say there are probably dozens uh, in principle, every three, uh, let's see, so if you have a rec A, there are, there's one rec A bound per three nucleotides. So if you have a 3,000 nucleotide, let's just keep it 300 nucleotide piece of DNA, you have 100 rec A molecules on it. 
So in principle, you have 100 different binding sites. And so um, and, um, you can use any number of those to enable uh, transfer events within the domain, the three-dimensional domain of the DNA. And through this iterative process, you can then uh, increase the rate at which you find homology by staying within that three-dimensional domain. And of course, if you extend the DNA to its linear contour length form, you can't do any of that. So uh, different people uh, respond to different metaphors. Um, so the one I, I give is, you know, this is a little bit, and maybe this is inspired by old jungle movies, Tarzan, those, those of you who have no idea what Tarzan is. If, if you watch chimpanzees or monkeys swinging through trees, right? I mean, I mean if you want to get from one tree to another, and you have polyvalency, arms, feet, and, and a, a mechanism to get there, why would you climb down the tree, run across the ground, and go up the other tree? when you have a way of basically swinging from one to another. Now, there's no inertia at this level. There's a, there, all analogies break down when you go from nano to macro. You know, at some point, we go from nano to macro scale. But the idea is that you can search more efficiently if you stay within the domain of where you started from, provided it's the right domain to be in, in the first place. And so um, this, again, um, Oh, I left a slide in here. So I, I, I gave that. I, sorry, I gave that that analogy, and, and somebody came out to me afterward. In fact, it was one of my postdocs who was at Berkeley. He said, "I just, I, you know, he said there's a paper on this." And so uh, I, this is exactly the paper. I didn't make any of this up. And and uh, again, for, let, let's put the inertia issue aside, which is wrong. But it turns out that there's a paper showing that uh, orangutans can. Uh, 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 cal they calculate energetic costs of, of gap crossing. So, and it turns out that it's much easier if an orangutan uh, uh, swings as opposed to uh, less than half as costly as jumping in an order of magnitude less costly than descending a tree, walking through the vine, and climbing it again. So, um, uh, at a certain level, there are different, um, the strategies are similar. And so now we go back to this, this uh, picture here. And it turns out that I think the reason this um, branch of the search tree has been sort of underappreciated is to really see it properly. One, you require these sort of single molecule tools to be able to change the configuration of DNA and change the rate limiting step. But the second thing is you need a, a, a protein or a protein DNA complex, which is intrinsically polyvalent. And so the idea of it uh, having multiple contacts is a way of facilitating this, the search. And in addition, as Dan asked earlier, there might be a component of sliding on a, on a smaller scale, and we don't have the resolution to pick that up. So. Um, and so this, uh, this actually brings me almost to the end of that. So um, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, so th this, the mechanism for this search process has been in question for at least 30 years. The RECA homology search was defined in about 1979. And uh, it, you know, other than hand waving, we've not been able to say much about how it occurs. Uh, and the only other thing I'd like to sort of uh, you know, inform you about in a very general way is, once it finds a homologous sequence, how does it know it's homologous? Now, our experiments don't bear on this at all. However, there was a crystal structure uh, solved uh, a couple years back, ready by the Pavlovich lab. And I wrote a News and Views, which is actually one of the few papers, free News and Views, that's cited as much almost as one of my primary manuscripts. Uh, Pavlovich focused more on the protein structure. And what struck me when I looked at it uh, was the DNA structure in the filaments. So this is, uh, this is um, everyday duplex DNA. This is single-strand DNA within the filament de derived from a structure. This is duplex DNA within the filament derived from their structure. And this is a made-up structure of single-strand DNA. Uh, okay. Now, here's B-form DNA. And here's duplex DNA in the filament. I think you all can see there's a huge difference. And what struck me uh, sort of immediately was most of us had thought that the DNA would be isotropically extended. I mean, why not? It, uh, and when I didn't say it's within the filament, the DNA is, is extended by about 50%. So first assumption is it's uniform. But you can see it's not. And you can see it most clearly in the duplex DNA. But you can also, if you stare at the single-strand DNA, you can also see it. It's organized in triplets. There are three, a big space. Three, a big space. Big space, three. The three are, to a first approximation, B-form configuration. The space is almost maximum extension, about seven angstroms. And then you have B-form. So 
the process for, for identifying homologies is what years ago we called credit card energetics. So those of you who have credit cards appreciate this right away. You, 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 you get the free energy of binding first by, let's say, this will interact with this. And the three base pairs of, of contact will not cost you, you'll get free energy and it won't cost you anything, right? So it's, but if you want to, to ask whether the next three are homologous, you have to pay the cost of stretching that DNA uh, a huge amount. So and if you think about this, what's homologous? I mean, three base pairs, are three base pairs homologous? Uh, I can tell you biologically the answer is no. Biology says in, in bacteria, homology is a minimum of 25, but could be as many as 50 base pairs. So that means for a distance of 25 to 50 base pairs, you can go through an interrogation three nucleotides at a time. You, you, you first three are for free, then you pay a, a stretching cost. If the next three are homologous, you get back a free energy. But then you pay another cost. If the next three match up, you get back that cost. And it's nonlinear. You can figure this out that basically once you get to a certain point, your free energy curve will move to the, to the negative. I mean, it will be favorable. Uh, whereas if you have heterologies anywhere in there, you, even one nucleotide, you've lost some of your free energy at that step. And you can, again, go through the arithmetic of this and say, well, if I have a heterology, I just need a longer segment. I might, make it, I might not make it in 25, but I might make it in 50. And there's some wonderful physics being done by both information theory and modeling uh, on the actual uh, energetics of the homology search. But now I, I bring this up because I want to explain to you why you need to make a rec -A filament and why a monomer, for example, is totally insufficient for identifying sequence identities in DNA. It's an interrogation that has to occur over long distance and it has to have some energetics where if it's favorable, of course, you go forward. But if it's unfavorable, you reject it, and it can't be just a linear phenomena because otherwise you'd have close matches. You'd have too many close matches, and you'd have a lot of chromosomal instabilities. So um, now uh, this gets me to the, just, yeah. something. So back in the, the soup of the rec -A molecules, the rec -A's already are assembled to the relevant single strands. Right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yep. So when the DNA is resect resected, rec -A assembles on it. Uh, but there's a, a, a key thing that that is also competitive with another DNA binding protein called SSB. And it's something I can comment on. I think there's a little bit of time to go forward. But, but I want to sort of stop here because I'm going to sort of go to another part. Um, I mean, I want to break up the discussion into discussion of this part, and then I'll go to the next part as far as I can and, and call it quits so that you're all not too tired. Yes. From, from this uh, very extended structure, I don't now understand why the, the coil uh, structure is required for the recognition because here it looks like uh, if, if, if we have maximum extension, oh. it, should, uh, it should bind. Right. The best. So the, the, the coil structure is required only for the rate. So that is the rate at which you find the, the, uh, the sequence is near zero when you have a, the DNA extended. And there are at least two reasons for that. But the main reason is it's very hard to uh, have effective polyvalent, multivalent uh, contacts on the DNA that's extended, right? So the, let me see if I can go back here. I'll put it another way. Um, when DNA is extended, uh, this uh, step, the, the uh, affinity is very low. The apparent affinity is very low. And then this state, this rate constant becomes very, uh, very low also. So it's all a rate effect. If I could somehow get the rec -A filament to the DNA sequence, if I waited long enough, it would find homology. So it would be independent of 3D structure. But the rate at which it does this is highly dependent uh, on, this, uh, on this, this, this two-step process. Anything else? Yes, in the back. This one? This DNA is, is, how can I say that? You have one of 
proteins to stabilize this single strand DNA to, for you to have your double strand DNA interacting with the single strand DNA and making the recombination and the, the, the process of the recombination or not. Yeah. No, so it turns out uh, Rec A and its, it's eukaryotic analogs, RAD51, um, do this without any other proteins. So it's simply the, the pure Rec A or RAD51 filament. I will mention as we go forward here, there are some proteins which uh, I had in that uh, fir very first slide in the beginning that work at that step. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is that those are catalysts of Rec A assembly. So they do help, but not at the level of this, of this slide. And so life is about rates, right? So that's another issue. Does anyone, everyone understand how homology search works now? Polyvalency is a, is a key, and the ability to be able to bridge multiple contacts with weak interactions. So remember, every interaction made at a non-homologous non site is weak. But if you have many non-homologous contacts, the filament stays associated with the DNA because you sum up all those free energies. But any one contact is short, is, is short-lived because it's weak interactions. That allows you to make a stable, non, uh, make a filament that finds homology and can rapidly search. Okay, so according to my clock, I still have time. Um, and I, again, I, I will stop in the 90 minutes allotted, but I, I'm happy to answer questions if you're staying alert and following me. So. Okay, so how do you make a filament? So now that I told you what the filament does, the question is, how do you make it? All right? And so, um, you know, there's again some assembly required. So I, I also, I'm a, you know, I've always been interested in reconstituting things, and one of my reconstitution projects is shown here. So um, those, let's see, how many of you even know what vehicle that is? Any, any Brits in the audience? Uh, no, it's not a beetle, no. No, it's... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you thinking. It's something to think about until the end of the... You can, somebody can ask me a question at the end. But, uh, so uh, I like putting things together. And one of the things we've been working on for, for, again, for decades is understanding how the filament goes together. So this is some beautiful electron micrograph uh, microscopy uh, imagery construction done by Ed Eggleman. Uh, we collaborate with him on that. And here's a structure from Phoebe Rice of a eukaryotic analog. And at, again, to the, for the level of this talk, uh, they're all the same. By that I mean you make uh, a right-handed uh, helix with about six monomers per turn, and the DNA is extended by about 50%. And you can look at these filaments for distances of uh, tens of thousands of nucleotides, and they're nice, beautiful helical filaments. So you can make very, very nice uh, structures out of this. So um, how do you make uh, a filament? Well, it turned out this is, again, something that eluded us for many years. And the reason is that as, even though we can very easily manipulate double-stranded DNA, we can't manipulate single-strand DNA as easily. Technical reasons. One, the <coughs> persistence length of, of single-strand DNA is very small. Uh, it's, it's a fraction of double-strand DNA. Secondly, single-strand DNA has a tendency to stick. It sticks to beads. Thirdly, single-strand DNA has secondary structure, so it tends to clump up on itself and also aggregate with other molecules in terms of fortuitous uh, annealing reactions. So basically, single-strand DNA has been a royal pain, right? And, and what Jason Bell is, he developed a, a, what in retrospect should have been a simple strategy, but it took, again, many years to develop this. And so what he does is he starts with lambda DNA, again, uh, biotinylates it, but then he, he alkali denatures it. And hopefully many of you remember that if you put DNA into alkali, it will uh, dissociate into its component strands. Um, and now if you, um, before you neutralize this, you neutralize it with a solution that contains an SSB protein, single strand binding protein. And these are proteins that bind non-specifically and cooperatively to DNA. You basically uh, sequester all the single strand DNA. And as a bonus, you remove most of the secondary structure. And then we attach this to the surface of a, of a flow cell, uh, and we image it using turf. And here are two images using two different E. coli SSBs. And here's a third one, uh, and I can't read it. D different this is fluorescein, two different alexafluoride dyes. 
And then RPA stands for the eukaryotic protein called replication A. It's the eukaryotic analog. And we can look at that DNA also um, and, and trap uh, well-behaved single-strand DNA. All right, so then, uh, as I said, the configuration is a turf microscope uh, with a, a flow cell. And uh, this, again, just shows you how we do it. We're going to do two-color imaging. Um, and under flow, and the, the DNA will only be attached at one end. So here's the strategy. And I'll tell you why it's, again, more complicated than it would seem to be. So we denature the DNA, renature it in the presence of SSB. And this is roughly to scale. That is, the SSB DNA complex is very compacted. And that's because the DNA wraps around the SSB tetramers. Then what we have to do is we exchange that SSB with wild type SSB because we discovered that the fluorescent SSB protein is attenuated in its single strand DNA binding properties. And we wanted to look at the assembly of Rec A on DNA with the wild type SSB. And then we'll initiate the reaction by flowing in fluorescent Rec A. And then I'll show you some, some data as to how it looks. Now again, let me s state something explicitly, which I, I, I might have said before. When DNA is resected, and you create single-strand DNA, that single-strand DNA doesn't just sit there in the cell. It becomes bound very rapidly in diffusion-controlled reaction by SSB. And that SSB is a competitor to Rec A. So the biological reaction is to watch the assembly of Rec A on single-strand DNA in the presence of SSB. And so that's what this is all set up for. And the, again, the rationale for me making that explicit will become evident as I, as I go along. So here's the data. So here's the fluorescent SSB single-strand DNA complex, uh, very compacted relative to contour length. We wash out the fluorescent SSB, replace it with wild-type SSB, which is non-fluorescent, and then introduce Rec A and simply watch fluorescent Rec A. And so each one of those spots represents a nucleation event. And so again, now to go back to what, if you remember way back to Dan Cox's first lecture, um, if you, when you watch uh, <coughs> There are many mechanisms for assembly of uh, filaments. Uh, the mechanism I'll tell you is going to apply here is a two-step mechanism where there's a slow nucleation phase followed by a rapid growth phase. So there's one nucleus. There's two. Um, you can see a second one starting. They split off. And again, the Rec A filament extends the DNA. So you can see these spots move out to the right in, in addition to gaining in intensity. Um, we don't have, again, this is optical resolution, so we're not seeing a single uh, 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 small, you know, we're not seeing a single protein there, but rather a locus where a nucleation occurred. And um, I joked before, if you can count to 10, you could be a biophysicist in the lab, because if you count the number of spots, keep track of the time, you can calculate the nucleation frequency. And um, I'll show you that in a second, but we also have computers helping us calculate how many uh, uh, nucleation spots there are, and you can count them by eye pretty easily up to about here. At some point, it, you know, you, you can ask the question, are these truly novel events or are they uh, 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 instrumental artifacts? But we, we, we've done this with enough data that we can show this with confidence. And so here's a movie. So that's the fluorescent SSB. Uh, we'll just tether it at one end. He's going to... Uh, exchange out the fluorescent SSB, replacing it with non-fluorescent SSB protein, and then initiate the reaction of it by introducing the fluorescent Rec A. And the time scale is very long, 10, 20 minutes. But you can, again, see the spots appearing, and they're shifting to the nuclei are shifting to the right as they grow. And um, we were actually quite surprised it was taking this long, um, but we shouldn't have been. And then um, you can, uh, of course, plot this. So these are single molecule data. Number of clusters uh, normalized per 10,000 nucleotides. It's a function of time. You can see it's linear in time. OK, good. So the number of nuclei you form is linear. 
If you do this as a function of the protein concentration, what you see is as you raise the protein concentration, the rate at which you get nucleation increases. Again, this is everyday kinetics. Uh, but now if you plot this linear rate as a function of rec concentration, what you see is that it is not uh, linear with concentration. In fact, it's a second power dependence. And so this kind of analysis defines the critical nucleus. So that means you need a dimer of rec A to form a nucleus. It turns out this makes complete sense because I showed you part of a crystal structure. It turns out that ATP binds at the interface between two monomers. So the minimum repeat unit is a, is a dimer. Uh, once you start the dimer, you can then grow to the end. But to, to, to get a dimer, you need to get a nucleus. Uh, turn it the other way. We rationalize why you need a dimer, because you need the ATP uh, bound at the interface. You can then look at growth. And um, one of the things you'll see is that um, you can take any nucleus, and it will grow with time. We start losing resolution here, so we stop. But a new nucleus is formed. It grows. There's one out here that forms and grows. And so then we can plot the rates of growth. And you can see, the, 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 first of all, the nucleation is stochastic. So notice none of these curves extrapolate to the same point. And that's what's to be expected for a, a stochastic nucleation event. The rates of growth also vary substantially. And I'm going to tell you that's in part because it can grow from one or the other or both ends. And I'll tell you also that the rates of growth at each end are uh, different. And again, I'll point out that these are actually things you cannot learn in any other way except doing single molecule analysis. If you think about it, you just can't interrogate a single filament and, and learn uh, and, and get uh, rates at either end. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, th there's the rate de determination. And I should point out um, that this lag time is an independent way of determining the nucleation time. And I'm going to just skip the, the data and tell you that when you look at the analysis of this lag time as a function of rec A concentration, it, the time decreases in a rec A concentration dependent way, but the power dependence is also two. So we don't have to directly image nucleation. We can image uh, filament growth, extrapolate to zero time, use that as a measure of a, a nucleation event, and then uh, that gives us exactly the same numbers we obtained for direct measurements. So, do the filaments grow unidirectionally or bidirectionally? <clears throat> and so we came up with this experiment to test that. Uh, what we're going to do is lay down nuclei using uh, Psi 3 labeled rec A, that's the red. And then what we're going to do is exchange out the red rec A and put in fluorescein rec A, which is green. And I'll show you what the data look like. You tell me. So the red, at time zero, there are two red spots, rec A psi 3. I think you see already after 10 minutes, there's a green extension on this red f nucleus. And after 20 minutes, there's a green extension growing on this same one, but a new one on the other nucleus. And they continue to grow. And then if you look carefully, there's one that's growing. To, then you start to grow from the right of the red nuclei. There's a novel nucleation event right in the middle. Ignore that one. So you can actually see that it grows preferentially to your left, but it will also grow to your right. And it turns out that it's growing towards the three prime end. And the data are here. It's about a two-fold difference. Now, why is that important? It turns out, remember, the, resec the rules of resection are such that the three prime end is the one that's left. And so if you have a piece of DNA that goes five prime to three prime, and you want that three prime end to invade, you might say to yourself, ah, well, biology can be smart. It can start growing at the three prime end and then go that way. But if it's the binding event is stochastic and you want to make sure it's covered towards the three prime end, you have it grow preferentially towards the three prime end, right? So you grow, bind randomly, and you want it to go this way, then it grows that way. Okay, and then um, here's, uh, 
Here's the video. And I think you can convince yourself by staring at these uh, more than once that the growth is uh, bidirectional, but with a preference towards towards the your your left side. Okay, so okay, I'm going to just give you two two more slides, and I'm going to skip the, the the last part, and I'll take questions. So, what I didn't tell you is that in order to get these experiments to work, uh, we took advantage of a well-known biochemical property of the protein uh, that the assembly, um, the functionality of RecA is enhanced by uh, going to lower pH, 6.5. Uh, but we've done experiments all the way out to, to pH 8. And it's pretty clear that what's dramatically affected is the nucleation rate more so than the growth rate. Now, one lesson from this uh, is that it, the, the filament assembly behavior is not optimal. Uh, new, uh, physiological pH is about pH 7.5. You're, we're about almost tenfold down from the optimum. So the RecA filament can grow much faster in terms of its physical behavior uh, than it does at pH 7.5. And it turns out that if you, th again, think about that, that's a good thing. And why do I say that? There are numerous examples in biology. Uh, uh, let me, let me, oh, I didn't have. There are numerous examples in biology where you take a very, very good, en uh, either a good binding protein or a good enzyme, and with the you know, exception of uh, um, carbonate anhydrase, I believe, none of the proteins operate at their catalytic maximum. And the reason, not, 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 many do not, and the reason for this is if you want to regulate a process, you can't regulate something both ways if it's running at full speed. You only have one option is to shut it down. But if you want to control something to be either faster or slower and be compatible with the biology of the organism, it, it turns out you see this new time and time again. You take something that's uh, optimized and then tune it down. And then you can control it with regard to going up or down with regard to rate. And the reason why this, this is a summary, the reason this becomes important, here's the cartoon. So what we think is going on, I've already said this, is a dimer is the species that needs to nucleate, but it's being blocked by SSB. Once you get the dimer to form, you form this critical nucleus, and then it can grow very readily. And the growth phase is relatively simple uh, through monomer addition. Now, it turns out that this is the part I was wanting to show you, is that if left uncatalyzed, nucleation of, of a RecA filament in vivo on about 1 kb of DNA would take about one hour. Now, one hour is more than a lifetime of E. coli. It's doubling time is 20, 30 minutes. So why? Well, I kept saying Rec A binds to single-strand DNA. I also kept telling you SSB binds there first and prevents Rec A from getting on. And uh, those of you who are the biologists in the crowd, you're hopefully have been thinking all along, saying, well, what about replication? Why doesn't Rec A bind to every piece of DNA during replication? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's exactly the answer why it doesn't. It's because if you allowed RecA to polymerize at its optimal rate and displace SSB, every Okasaki fragment, remember uh, DNA is synthesized in a discontinuous manner, leading is continuous, lagging strand is discontinuous, creating about 1 kb pieces of single strand DNA every second. You don't want Rec A binding to all that because it's not damaged DNA. It's everyday metabolism. So it turns out that biology has throttled this back to a point where it won't assemble. And what I would tell you, but I won't uh, in detail, is that the proteins down here in purple that I didn't tell you about, I won't have time to tell you about, are catalysts of Rec A self-assembly. So the way you regulate a machine is to regulate its self-assembly by other partners. And the REC O complex, REC F complex, REC, uh, REC FOR complex are those proteins which actually, uh, the, the next slides I can't show you, um, are proteins that increase the rate of nucleation by about tenfold. And they target the REC A to the spots where uh, you want it to work. Now, Again, all this is, is uh, you know, for me, wonderful because it's taken us uh, decades to get to this point. And 
those of you who have more of a practical bent will wonder, uh, what does this have to do with you know, my, my health? I, I have to write these progress reports to the NIH. So it turns out the analogs of REC, F, O, and R, like I said, which I don't have time to tell you about today, is a protein that's incredibly important to human health. It's BRCA2, the breast cancer susceptibility gene 2. Breast cancers result from loss of heterozygosity of BRCA2. And BRCA2 is a protein who has one major function in the cell, and that is to catalyze the self-assembly of RAD51 onto DNA when it's damaged. And these are the direct analogs of these eukaryotic proteins. And so uh, I think th these kinds of tools become very informative with regard to the whole spectrum of proteins involved in these processes. And I think with that, um, I'm going to scoot to the end here, skip the movie and the data, and skip that, and go to the people who do all the work. This is a short list of people who do the work. Uh, we make vanity slides. So those of you who want to have slides, <laughs> slides that, and I also, I forgot to bring them in. We make keychains. I have, I have a keychain that looks like a three-channel flow cell. Um, I, oftentimes, if I have the presence of mind before I leave for a meeting, I'll bring, bring them. I'll be selling, selling them in the back of the lobby. It helps fund the lab research. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> we've had many, these are the people who did the work, and we certainly have many molecules who, uh, who are well-behaved and also did their fair share. So, uh, <laughs> I, so uh, I'm ending it formally now. I'll take any questions on any part, but uh, hopefully, uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening through this after the Rio day. It, uh, it's a really, I think, a really basic question, and I, I, I would like to understand uh, the, the main principles of the technique uh, that, uh, poss poss uh, that make possible to, to bind the DNA to that bead and to, be, to, to can stretch and manipulate the DNA bound to the bead. I, I didn't say. Yeah, so uh, for, yeah, that's an easy question. Um, so we take beads. They're one micron uh, polystyrene beads. They come, um, we, you can purchase them with streptavidin uh, covalently attached to the surface. And streptavidin has a very high affinity for uh, uh, biotin. And it has four uh, ligand binding sites for avidin. And on the DNA side, we incorporate um, uh, uh, analogs that have... Uh, uh, biotin in the uh, on the on the on the on the uh, uh, back on on the uh, on the base, and so you basically have a um, avidin stripped avidin sorry biotin stripped avidin uh, bond. It's non-covalent, but it's uh, sorry. Yeah, the affinity is huge. It's uh, yep yep. It's uh, it. It's, uh, it's one of the highest non-covalent binding constants known. It's about 10 to the 11th per molar, 10 to, 10, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 per molar. So it's a uh, uh, molar. It's very high. Uh, so, and that, that, it's one of the things that limits the lifetime. If you apply too much force or wait too long, they'll detach. But typically, in our case, the DNA molecules break before that point. But if you, if you, you saw the pulling experiments, we're probably applying about... Um, on the order of 10 piconewtons of force when we were doing those dumbbell games. And the, the biotin stripped avidin linkage is completely stable, even up to, uh, we've used it up to 60 to 80 piconewtons of force. Um, when you move the bead through the DNA chamber and attach the DNA, how can you um, exclude the possibility that the two single strands have aggregated? Can you just see the fluorescence intensity double right. or? All right, so typically, um, typically that's, that's, you're absolutely right. So whenever we have two DNA molecules, you, you, you can actually pick it up in intensity profile. So, um, uh, I mean, if it, more, more often than not, when we pick up two, one's broken. 
And you can, you can very clearly see, because you have 2x intensity and 1x intensity, but once you get well versed in the method, uh, people can very quickly see whether there's one or two attached. It's, it's, it's really quite straightforward. Um, oh, Christian. These uh, regulatory proteins you were mentioning in the end uh, for, for the assembly of Reg, Reg A, I mean, are they then up or, and down regulated? Uh, for example, that they are not there during replication, or I mean, how, how do they regulate the... Uh, so um, the answer there is just a little bit complicated. So in bacteria, they're, they're not. Um, and even in eukaryotes, they tend not to be uh, up or down regulated. Um, I mean, one reason for uh, understanding this again, and oh, this, this was something I, uh, I want to also mention, was you know, many people think uh, that complexes should come you know, pre-assembled. You know, co you know, and you know, uh, we heard from Ruth wonderful uh, stories of you know, the complex interaction map. And there clearly are very stable complexes in the cell. But the DNA response machinery, if you think about it, is, are the ambulance, fire, and uh, police departments. And, and they need to be summoned to a place of damage that will be uh, unanticipated. So they typically assemble on site and bring in components in a regulated way. So they're almost always constitutively expressed. In certain cases that, where they are regulated, they're typically regulated by phosphorylation or uh, ubiquitylation or simulation. So, and that's, of course, in the eukaryotes. In the prokaryotes, there's almost no regulations constitutive with the exception um, I I with damage, Rec A, for example, is highly induced. So the concentration. But then how, I mean, how does it work that during, I mean, like you mentioned, that during replication, uh, Rec A doesn't work? Yeah, so it, again, stochastic, life is stochastic. Um, the probability, uh, so uh, the, the, the answers come in two different forms. For the bacteria, it's simply a matter of timing. So if you think about replication, and I said a Nokazaki fragment is made every second, but that particular Okasaki fragment lasts for only one second because it's then re recopied, right? So any one is very short-lived. So you don't get a chance to even nucleate, and that blocks it. But if you have a DNA polymerase which has hit a lesion, which is a stalling lesion, and now it can't fill back the, let's say, the Okasaki fragment, that region of single-strand DNA will persist until the DNA is somehow repaired. So it's a timing issue, and that's why... Um, there's, you know, for the biologists in the crowd, there are some genetic suppressors of Rec A, which are pH sensitive. So other bacteria probably play with this pH game and or interface connections to, to, ch to regulate the timing of assembly relative to the organism's life. And it's very easy to do if you're not functioning at the, at the optimum all the time. Uh, eukaryotes use a little bit s smarter or complicated strategy. Um, if you have a persistent piece of single-strand DNA, you induce a, a, a damage response um, through a protein called ATR. And ATR is a, is, a, is a kinase. And the kinase actually phosphorylates the RPA, the SSB equivalent. And that is part of a signaling cascade and also calling in the police, fire, and ambulance departments onto that segment of DNA. So again, it's totally stochastic. However, there are ways to in terms of simple timing that allow uh, the cell to determine that that piece of DNA should be repaired because it's simply persisting too long. Yeah. Question here. When SSB uh, protein binds, uh, does it increase the kinetics of uh, Reg A um, search through the, the DNA? So, um, no, the short answer is no. I was going to say we certainly haven't imaged that at the single molecule level, but um, remember, Rec A is formally this antagonist of assembly. And everything that was been done biochemically says that once the, the, the major step is these two proteins always competing for binding to the, to the single strand of DNA. Uh, and whoever wins that competition, and it's a kinetic competition, uh, is then th that determines whether you have a Rec A filament or an SSB filament. SSB has never been seen to have an effect on the, the homo homology search itself. So it's interesting. We 
don't know if there's any proteins um, that enhance the homology search because there really have been no good tools for studying it. So this is one of the things we're interested in. And there are many, um, in particular, eukaryotic proteins that act with the RecA analog uh, whose functions are not known. And they, they have some characteristics which might suggest that they uh, allow the homology search to occur more rapidly. They, they, will, um, they will take DNA and, and basically condense it further. So if you think about the 3D search, if you can make the random coil smaller to, to a degree, you know, may, make it more compact, you could actually, um, in principle, uh, increase the rate at which the search occurs. Um, this is one of the things we'd like to test. And one, one very interesting uh, biological phenomenon, uh, you, you, I'll, I'll anticipate a question if you're thinking to ask me or haven't thought about it, how does this work with chromatin? So the duplex DNA in eukaryotes is, is in chromatin. So th the short answer is that, again, we don't know the details, but y everyone knows that nucleosomes, the DNA is wrapped around the outside, and it is accessible to things like restriction enzymes. So there is, an ex there is a potential for accessibility. Uh, the eukaryotic RAD51 proteins carries with it as a co-complex a chromatin remodeling protein. So it becomes then a location-specific chromatin remodeling event. So again, if you think about it, it's like going backpacking in snow. You carry your snow shovel or, or snow plow, right? So you, you know, you, when, you, when you need it, you're going to pull it out and clear the area. So, um, and, and the other side of that story is when DNA breaks, and there's some beautiful imaging, live cell imaging, that chromatin is this wonderful compact structure and you have little fluorescent markers on it. When you break the DNA at that spot, uh, you, you basically see the, the, the DNA when, as it becomes single-stranded, sort of liberated, and the, 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 the area uh, that the, the spots move, the, um, the three-dimensional space occupied by the single-strand tails, increases by at least tenfold. So you, you now have a, a uh, steps, you know, little pieces that allow you to start to understand how it would work and perhaps be enhanced in, in eukaryotes. Um, I just have a question. So the, the, the RECA itself, um, the self-assembly only happens in complex with a single-stranded DNA? Or, uh, and, and if so, what is it on what what is the protein-to-protein -protein interaction there of the RECA? So the answer is sort of one is mostly yes <laughs> to the first question. Right. So under normal conditions, the assembly is entirely DNA dependent, when I say normal conditions. It turns out like everything else, um, th there, there are these uh, interesting conditions where if you raise the salt concentration to about uh, two molar, which is so far off physiological that uh, you know, this, this is not relevant to that, to the physiological process, but it, it will spontaneously assemble into filaments. And both neutron scattering and some other data show that filament morphology characteristics are the same. Um, so if you want, you can imagine the DNA is simply serving as an electrostatic scaffold that's minimizing, eliminating some repulsion that you could uh, probably eliminate just through uh, raising the ionic environment to something high enough that allows the spontaneous self-assembly to occur. So, uh, so basically, it's DNA dependent, except you can force it to assemble in a DNA independent way. And, uh, and the interface, I'd have to pull up the crystal structure, but the interface is very well defined. Um, it's actually, uh, interestingly, it's beta sheets. It's beta sheets between one monomer that stack with uh, another beta sheet in, uh, in the other um, monomer. Uh -huh. and, and so... Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of betas on the ends and something else in the middle of the record. Um, the interface is a continuation of betas, and then the core part of it, um, of, the, of the RECA, which is not involved directly in an interface, but, you know, that's sort of a first kind of hand-waving answer, is this what's called the RECA core. And the RECA core is, is seen in almost all motor proteins. Uh, it comprises uh, the ATP binding structure. And every time ATP binds to ATP core, there's a certain amount of rearrangement of, of monomers and then the filaments. So, so that's a way of also regulating because if you, when you hydrolyze the ATP, you disrupt some of the interfacial contacts. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. any, uh, any other questions? Yeah. For example, 
in, in the replication. Uh, when the DNA, when, for example, the polymerase is replicated in the DNA and it finds a mismatch nucleotide, for example, with, with um, uh, it starts like a bubble in the, the, in, the, in the strain, and you see one template is, is fine, but the other template is not matching with the corresponding nucleotide. How, how, how for example, how the, the SCR is damaged? It's, it's a call like that, I don't know. How the rec can, it's the same mechanism that recognizes this, that recognizes this kind of mismatching in the DNA sequence. Right, now <clears throat> that's handled by an entirely different uh, DNA repair pathway called uh, mismatch repair. So mismatch repair will detect single base mismatches in DNA, and it works, uh, of course, after the polymerase. So after polymerase has gone through, if it misincorporates a single nucleotide, that single nucleotide mismatch, or uh, if it takes a, a jump and skips a few, puts in a bubble, uh, there's another mismatch recognition protein that recognizes that. And that's a whole other area, un unrelated to this directly, um, but it's, uh, it's a fidelity mechanism that's tied into replication. And it's, it's also another very smart one because it keeps track of, uh, in that case, you have to think about, well, which strand is the right one? So yeah, if you have a that, base... Right. Yes, my question is that what's, what template, what the, what the strand is the, the, the right to, to beat, to make the, the recombination or uh, repair? Yeah, biology has a way of making everyone sort of you know, outsmarting everybody, you know, when you, and when you realize it, you say, duh, I wish I thought of that. Um, so it turns out in bacteria, they're, they're different in bacteria and it's different in eukaryotes. In bacteria, there's a phenomenon called methylation. Uh, um, and uh, when you, the DNA is methylated after it's replicated. So as you're replicating, you, you're dupli you, when you start replicating your DNA, is, is, it has two methyl groups on both strands. When it's replicated, only one of the two strands is methylated, so it's hemimethylated. And the one that is methylated serves as the authentic marker for sequence to, re to ex re remove the mismatch the from the one that's not like mismatched. The parental right. template. This is the right one. Right. That's, and it's and methylated. Absolutely right. And in the eukaryotes, it's a totally different system that's still not totally completely understood, but it takes advantage of knowing where the replication fork is and knowing particularly on the lagging strand, it's better defined. On the lagging strand, uh, you're always going to have uh, discontinuous synthesis yeah. and you're going to have NICs. So keep track of NICs. The lagging strand is easy to understand. The leading strand is still being worked out. Um, so, and, but it turns out there are actually more errors introduced on the lagging strand than on the, yeah. Uh, yeah, on the leading strand than the lagging strand. So, um, th but there is a way of discerning that. And, I would say if it's, uh, as long as you can replicate and you don't stall, you don't pull in the, 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 the recombination right. repair okay. system. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I remembered I was going to ask you, so is there any chance, will it also, since it, uh, it binds to single-stranded DNA, can't it also bind to, bind to RNA? Ah, that's a, again, you know, th th that's a good question. The short answer is no. Uh, the <laughs> Well, I, I can give you more complicated answers, and I don't want to get too complicated. Um, uh, there's a, but there's a very interesting phenomenon in biology where um, I have to give just a little bit of history here because Rec A will stabilize R loops. So it won't make the R loops, but it will, in the canonical way, it will make them by actually binding double strand DNA, which it does very well, and then pulling in the RNA as a reactant. So it's kind of a non-canonical reaction. Um, and the reason why I mention this is because for years and years, people um, thought that during DNA replication in, in bacteria, you must have an origin. And there's only one origin in bacteria, some place to start. And if you delete the origin, uh, the, the bacteria won't grow. And the answer is basically that's true unless you play genetic tricks and look for things that allow it to grow in the absence of an origin. And what you find is that you need Rec A, and you need RNA, and you need these R loops. So it turns out these are real uh, biological species. And if you sort of dig in the evolution of bacteria, uh, origins are a very sophisticated concept. What they do is they allow bacteria to synchronize the replication, and importantly, control the replication. If you have good growth conditions, you fire the origins rapidly. If you have poor growth conditions, you throttle things back by not allowing the origin to fire replication. So it turns out um, these E. coli that don't have origins live just fine. 
but they live the wild and uncontrolled life. Maybe like they're living like they're in Rio, you know. So they, they just fire off replication whenever they want. Uh, they don't respond well to, to, to alcohol and things like that. No, so they're, 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 they're unregulated. <laughs> Yes. The bacteria uses like this sequence RNA sequence attenuators to to stop or to induce this or to induce the the application. Right. I mean, now you're getting to something a little more complicated, which is how you uh, how you regulate an origin. So origins are highly regulated events. Again, they're a sign of a sophisticated organism that wants that has succeeded in in evolution by controlling the timing of replication in a way that's meaningful. And there are several layers. Uh, I think, like I said, this, when Dan asked this question, the surprising thing was that you need these R loops and RECA to, to, to allow life without any origins, which was you know, sort of counter to a, a dogma at the, you know, about 10 year, 20 years ago. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, thanks again, Steve. That was sure, cool. sure. Thanks.